feeling good. All right. Pastors are only always out on the lookout for good news, especially when it comes to themselves. But sometimes it seems that a good dose of good news comes with a good dose of bad news. I one time had a parishioner collect a, a say, uh, some sayings about good news, bad news for the pastor. It goes like this. Good news, pastor, you baptized four people today. Bad news, you lost two others in the Swift River Current. Good news, pastor, the UMW voted to send you a good well card. Bad news, it passed 31 to 30. <laughs> good news, pastor, the church board accepted your job description the way you wrote it. Bad news, they also formed a search committee to find someone that's going to fit that description. <laughs> Good news, Pastor, your stand against the death penalty is one that respect and admiration of many people. Bad news, none of them are remotely connected to your church. Does that sound like you, Lauren, there? <laughs> Good news, Pastor, you finally found a choir director who approaches things your way. Bad news, the choir mutinied. Good news, 70 junior high students showed up last Thursday. Bad news, youth group was on Wednesday. Good news, pastor, the trustees finally voted to add more church parking. Bad news, they want to blacktop the lawn of the parsonage. I tell you, I've been thinking a lot about good news here lately. This summer, we have zeroed in on hope. And when you talk about hope, you begin to expect that. You know that hope is going to be your end goal. You begin to kind of look for it. And so when it comes to this discussion about hope in the epistles, we know that we're going to get to hope in the end. We just don't know, we just don't know how Paul is going to get us there. And I think that's intentional. As we have been reading these letters, it is no surprise that each community, each letter that Paul writes is a bit different. For example, many of us have had the opportunity this summer to do some travel. And I'm sure you've probably noticed something, that every time you go into a, another town or another state, it is a little bit different. Don't you think that everything would be kind of boring if it was all the same? For example... Um, I mean, why go to Alaska if you're going to see seals and polar bears in Colorado? Or why go to the Bahamas if that sandbar in the middle of the Platte River provides you the same magnificent views? And along with that, why go to Paris and look at the Eiffel Tower when, you know, the Lincoln Hotel is pretty tall? Or the Grand Canyon when, you know, there's a ditch over in Mitchell Valley that provides just magnificent views as well. Get the picture. This summer when we vacationed to Costa Rica, I kept thinking, this country is different. And I couldn't quite put my finger on it. I've been to Latin America before. I've been to Guatemala. I've been to Mexico. But there was something different about Costa Rica. And when I was in the airport, I picked up a book about the history of Costa Rica. I read about their history, and I learned, ah, this is what makes this country different than all of their neighbors. Each community that Paul is writing to, each letter is a bit different. Paul is writing to their needs. The church in Corinth is filled with lots of divisions. Rome is in the heart of the empire. Galatia is a church that Paul founded, but since that time, some other teachers have come in and are teaching some very un-Pauline things. And Colossians, the church at Colossae, is very different than the others. Now, this is a church that Paul did not found. His footprint, his DNA is not there. It doesn't reside with them, and so he's got this very different relationship. And contrary to like everything else that he has dealt with. And that's the reason that he makes a very different plea. We know that he's going to get to hope in the end. But the process is unlike anything else that is in Paul's hand. Let's go ahead and listen to a little bit the first part of the letter from Colossians. Paul, an apostle. 
apostle of, the, of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope you laid up for us in heaven. You have heard of the hope before the word of the truth, the gospel, that has come to you. Just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learn from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom or spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from His glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience, while joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Max. Now, when I read and hear this passage, I think of those moments of, of good news. Kind of like when you open up the newspaper and it's just filled with story after story of people helping out other people. Or when you open up your news feed and, and your phone and you read stories about people that are helping out and volunteering at the Humane Society. Or a stranded motorist that was helped out by a stranger. Or a visitor to a large city that was, that was given directions by a friendly local. These are stories of good news. These are notes of good news. And it provides us with hope because it reminds us that there are good people out there. And not everyone is in it for themselves. These values of helpfulness, and hopefulness, and trustworthiness still play a role in society. And even in the midst of gun violence and political gridlock and poverty, Good news can and will prevail. Mother Teresa once said, Spread love everywhere you go. First of all, in your own house. Give love to your children, to your wife or husband, to a next door neighbor. Let no one ever come to you without leaving better and happier. Be the living expression of God's kindness. Kindness in your face. Kindness in your eyes. Kindness in your smile. Kindness in in your warm greeting. Now that is a note of good news. We need inspirational people like Apostle Paul and Mother Teresa reminding us of hope, reminding us that good news can triumph. Listen to the story from Eric Butterworth. A college professor had his sociology class go into the Baltimore slums to get case histories of 200 young boys. They were asked to write an evaluation of each boy's future. In every case the students wrote, he hasn't got a chance. 25 years later, another sociology professor came across the earlier study. He had his students follow up on the project to see what had happened to these boys. With the exception of 20 boys who had either moved away or died, the students learned that 176 of the remaining 180 had achieved more than ordinary success as lawyers, doctors, and businessmen. The professor was astounded and decided to pursue the matter further. Fortunately, all the men were still in the area, and he was able to ask each one, how do you account for your success? And each man would always begin their story with, there was a teacher. The teacher was still alive. So we sought her out and asked the old but still alert lady what magic formula she had used to pull these boys out of the slums into successful achievement. 
The teacher's eyes sparkled and her lips broke into a gentle smile. It's really very simple, she said. I loved those boys. Don't you just love stories like that about good news? You know, the people of Colossae needed a message of good news. Because they've got a big challenge ahead of them. This is a, a church that is at odds over one issue. Are you ready for it? It's knowledge. I know knowledge. Now, the whole argument is really complicated, so let me kind of give you the Cliff, Cliff Notes version or the Wikipedia version. It is a debate over asceticism. And what is asceticism? Well, one definition is ab absence from sexual pleasures, often for the purpose of pursuing spiritual goals. This is not a debate over eating food that is dedicated to idols. This is not a debate over which apostle baptized whom. This is not even a debate over sexuality. This is an academic debate. And it is creating divisions in their community. Now, Paul could start out his letter by saying, you know, your side is wrong, and your side is right, and I'm going to talk about all the ways to convince this side to join this side. But he doesn't. He begins his letter with a note of good news. In particular, he tells them of all the good things that they're doing as a church. In essence, he's reminding them that the main thing is still the main thing. And this debate over asceticism shouldn't override the good news of the mission of the church. A note of good news is a reminder of what the church is all about, what it's supposed to do, and what it's supposed to be. I've asked the ushers to bring you some cards. And uh, so they're going to hand out some cards and envelopes to you. And uh, since I've got one up here, I will, I will get Max's. Oh, you got it? Okay. And if you need pencils, they're also going to be handing those pencils out as well. I want you to write some good news. I want you to write something positive in your life. Something great about waking up this morning. Something that you witnessed this week, whether it was at church, or was at home, or work, or maybe even on your morning walk. Anything but negative. Anything but divisiveness. Nothing bad here, nothing harmful, nothing destructive. I'll give you a couple minutes, and then I'll tell you a story. if you haven't received a card yet so the ushers know.
Some of you are still writing, and that's okay. But I'm going to tell you a story, and you can continue to write. This story comes from Norman Vincent Peale. And he tells a good news story about a man who makes and sells greeting cards. I recall a man who often came to our church in a wheelchair. He was more agile in handling that chair than many people are on their feet. He had been in that chair since he was 17 when he was crippled by rheumatic fever. His family was four. His mother and father both worked, leaving him alone, sitting in his chair, saying to himself ceaselessly, useless Useless, useless. Then one day he said to himself, I'm not useless. He picked up the Bible and began to read. Finally he was saying to himself, So what if I have no leg power? So what if I have no arm or hand power? I have a sound mind. There is nothing crippling my mind. <clears throat> he continued to read. And the Bible told him he had soul power. I can't run like other guys. I can't use my hands well but I can use my mind and my soul with the best of them. He finally figured out what he could do. He decided that he could make greeting cards. With his gnarled and crippled hands, it took him about a week to make the first card. And he suffered indescribable pain. But he sold the card at a profit. And today, according to Norman Vincent Peale, when he wrote this story, he has a company making these cards by the thousands. Now the cards that you just wrote or are in the process of writing, you can keep. You can send it to a friend that needs a note of good news. Or you can turn it into us. But if you do, you are giving us permission to share your good news with others. You see... This is what Paul is doing here. He is lifting up the people of Colossae with good news. And he is saying, you are doing a good job. You are representing Christ in your community. You will get through this academic challenge if you stay focused on the main thing. You just need to focus on good news. Of why you are the church why you are the people who follow Christ. And that to me is hope. That to me is faith. That to me is love. A teacher in New York decided to honor each of her seniors in high school by telling them the difference that they made using a process developed by Elise Bridges of Del Mar, California. She called each student to the front of the class, one at a time. First, she told them that how they made a difference to her and the class. Then she presented each of them with a blue ribbon and printed with gold letters that read, Who I am makes a difference. Afterward, the teacher decided to do a class project to see what kind of impact recognition would have on a community. She gave each of the students three more ribbons and instructed them to go out and spread this acknowledgement ceremony. Then they were to follow up on the results, see who honored whom, and report back to the class in about a week. One of the boys in the class went to a junior executive in a nearby company and honored him for helping him with his career plan. He gave him a blue ribbon and put it on the shirt. Then he gave him two extra ribbons and said, we're doing a class project in recognition. And we'd like you to go out, find someone to honor, give them a blue ribbon, then give them the extra blue ribbon so they can acknowledge a third person to keep this acknowledgement ceremony going. Then please report back to me and tell me what happened. Later that day, the junior executive went in to see his boss, who had been noted was kind of a grump. He sat his boss down and told him he deeply admired him for being a creative genius. The boss seemed very surprised. The junior executive asked him if he would accept the gift of the blue ribbon and would he give him permission to put it on him. The surprised boss said, well, sure. The junior executive took the blue ribbon and placed it right on the boss's jacket above his heart. As he gave him the last extra ribbon, and said, he said, would you do me a favor? 
Would you take this extra ribbon and pass it on by honoring somebody else? The young boy who gave me the ribbons is doing a project in school, and we want to keep this recognition ceremony going and find out how it affects people. That night, the boss came home to his 14-year-old son and sat him down and said, the most incredible thing happened to me today. I was in my office and one of our junior executives came in and told me he admired me and he gave me a blue ribbon for being a creative genius. Imagine that. He thinks I'm a creative genius. <clears throat> anyway, he then put this blue ribbon that says, who I am makes a difference on my jacket above my heart. He gave me an extra ribbon and asked me to find somebody else to honor. <clears throat> As I was driving home tonight, I started thinking about whom I would honor with this ribbon. And I thought about you. I want to honor you. And then he said, my days are really hectic, and when I come home, I don't pay a lot of attention to you. Sometimes I scream at you for not getting good enough grades in school or for your bedroom being a mess. But somehow, tonight, I just wanted to sit here and, well, just let you know that you make a difference to me. Besides your mother, you are the most important person in my life. You're a great kid, and I love you. The startled boy began to sob and sob. And he wouldn't stop crying. His whole body shook. And finally, when he calmed down, he looked at his dad and he says, I was planning on committing suicide. I didn't think anybody loved me. This blue ribbon just saved my life. Everybody needs a note of good news. We knew that Paul would get us to hope. 